Last week, we heard from Pastor Steve uh, at this parable from Matthew 25. One of the things I love about parables, they invite you to ask yourself a question. And the question is, at what point, who am I in this story? It invites you into the narrative to ask yourself, uh, which one of these characters am I? And at different stages in our life, we might be uh, different people. You might be able to look back on your own story and say, well, you know, at this point in my life, I was like this. And like at this point in my life, I was like that. And so I asked for permission. I wanted to preach the same text that uh, he did last week. And he said, go for it. Sounds like fun. Um, because I've just been chewing on this and meditating on this text and, uh, or on this parable. And he finished last week, Pastor Steve, by saying that the struggle you are in today is developing the strength that you will need for tomorrow. What are you doing with the opportunity? Amen. I thought that was a good way to leave that sermon, a great question to ask. And so today we are going to continue on the same text, Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 14. If you are able and if you are willing, will you please stand for the reading of God's word? This is the parable of talents, parable of the coin. This interpretation says bags of gold. So if you're wondering why I went with this one, it's just because that's much cooler than talents or coins. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey. Again, it will be like what? This is the kingdom of heaven is what he's talking about. It'll, it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold. To another, two bags. And to another, one bag, according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag of gold, he went off and he dug a hole in the ground and he hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and he settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five bags of gold brought the other five, the master. He said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come. Share in your master's happiness. I love that. The man with the two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold and I have gained two more bags of gold. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share in your master's happiness. In verse 24, the man who had received one bag of gold came and he said, Master, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid. I went out. I hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvested where I have not sown and I gathered where I have not scattered seed? Question mark there is important. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him, give it to the one who has 10 bags for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And may God add his blessing to our reading of his word this morning. You may be seated. It's a bit of a long parable, but it's sandwiched in between. Any, anytime you read in the word and it starts with again, then we know that it implies that it's connected to what has come before it and to what is coming after it. So right here in Matthew 25, it begins with the parable of the 10 virgins. 
And then some of you may know that one. And then it has this parable of the talents or the coins or the bags of gold. And then finally he finishes with the parable of the sheep and the goats where he separates them. It's, it's, it's a very beautiful chapter. Uh, like I said, I decided to go with bags of gold, but from the commentaries that I read, the basic equivalent of one talent or this system of measuring money that they're, that they're saying, that one talent is an equivalent to 20 years of a laborer's wage. So one bag of gold, one talent, one, one, in this parable is equivalent to 20 years of work. It's a lot of money. It's an incredible amount of money. And sometimes when this parable is taught, it's actually taught where a talent is actually your talent. Have you ever heard that? Where they say, you know, if you don't use your talent for God in the way that God wants you to use your talent for him, then he's going to throw you in hell. I think that's a pretty bad misinterpretation of this parable. But we preachers are pretty good at misinterpreting things sometimes. Sometimes when this parable is taught, it becomes all about do more, try harder. What are you doing with what you've been given? Do more or be judged. It's kind of the total but we have to believe, I have to believe that Jesus has more going on here than some kind of sanctimonious judgment. The outrageousness of this story is a really potent clue. This story is absurd. And a first century listener would have heard this story and it would have been really laughable. They would have known like, okay, this is, this is a setup. This is like, amazing. This is great storytelling because who on earth gives this much money away? Not to his financial advisor, not to his poker buddies, not to uh, you fill in the blank, but to servants. So right off the bat, we have this ridiculous crazy, beautiful story of a man who has accumulated a vast amount of wealth, goes on a trip and leaves it in the care of his servants. Amen. It's interesting that for the majority of the story, the boss is somewhere else. And the truths about this parable lie just below the surface. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. I need to share with you the bigger context so that we can understand particularities about this parable. This is right before Jesus is about to go into Jerusalem here. He starts to tell his disciples where this whole thing is headed. He's showing them this is what leadership looks like. They have ideas in their own heads about how this is going to work. About him being the son of David the conquering king, the one who would overthrow the Roman empire. They had their ideas, but Jesus is saying, no, no, this ends very, very differently. My thing is very different. It, it will not be salvation by winning, but by dying. It's important to remember this as we read this parable that Jesus is preparing his disciples for something really extraordinarily different than what they are thinking is about to happen. But think about growth moments in your own life. It's most likely that there was some form of death or dying that took place before that new life or that new thing came about and happened. Are you with me? Amen. I wish it weren't like that, but that's how it is. The old goes and the new comes. Usually there's some form of suffering we go through before we learn the lesson we need to learn, right? Are we awake this morning? I'm personally 
kind of dying my own nervous death because I'm not holding a microphone and I don't know what to do with my hands. I always hold the mic because it just gives me something. I only have to worry about this one, but now I have to worry about both of these. <clears throat> and the other thing is I, when I get nervous, I put my hands in my pocket. And so now not only do I not have a microphone, but I'm trying not to keep my hands in my pocket while I'm also telling a story about bags of gold. I'll just hold the pulpit when I, this is this okay. You're a terrible sinner, so do more with the talent that you have. No, 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 no. The story begins with, number one, if you're taking notes, unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. He trusts servants, the lowliest of the low, and the instigating incident of the story is grace and abundance and generosity. The owner giving massive amounts of money to those who did not earn it. He doesn't ask them to be productive with it. He gives them no boundaries or quotas or rules. The only requirement seems to be that they do something with it. The owner has tremendous abundance. And what he does is pass it on to the least among these. We see Mary struggling with this when the angel comes and tells her that she's going to be given this abundant, generous, free gift. And she's got something that she's going to bring into the world. And then she has this beautiful Magnificat, right? Where you have lifted, like you have seen me in my poverty and you have lifted us into this new place. Had a young man the other day, I was driving him somewhere else. I was at, I was at his house with his, hanging out with his dad and he was going somewhere that was close to my block. So they were like, hey, you know, take my kid. And uh, he's 15, can't drive yet. And I'm like, hey, what's going on? And he said, man, I'm about to go to Honduras for the first time on a missions trip. I said, that is fantastic. And then he did the next best thing. He said, you know, but I'm still short on the money that I need. <laughs> I said, okay, I got a couple bucks on that, you know, I'll give you some money. And then uh, I think my dad actually had him trim bushes and then gave him money. I didn't know that that was an option. Like you can put these kids to work and then pay them for their missions trip. I'm going to remember that next year. I just gave the kid money. But he said, hey, what do, I, what do I need to know? And I said, listen, the thing you need to know before you go on your trip, you need to not pack anything that you are going to be, uh, that, that, that you're going to, don't pack anything that you're not willing to give away. There's, there's no way you're going to get down there. You, you, if you have the shoes on your feet left, you're going to be lucky because you can't get into that place with these amazing, wonderfully happy, beautiful people and not be confronted with the absurd wealth and comfort in which we live. And your response to that is not to have somebody do more or, or be more or do better. Your response is just to give what you have because the gift is in the giving of what you have. You think you're going down there to give them something and you do physically, monetarily every time, but really you find that you learn so much more about your place in this world, about the gift that God has so graciously and, and, and masterfully given to us. It, if you feel like you cannot relate to the master in this story, let me just tell you, if you're here this morning in America, uh, you, you can relate to the master in this story. If you shop at a store that has a whole aisle for food that we give away to dogs, then you can understand what it is to be the master in this story. So it begins with unmerited favor. It's also on some level about risk. The story begins with a massive 
risk. He rolls the dice on servants. He rolls the dice on their participation in the grace and the blessing and the favor and the gift. The owner is not just okay with the risk. He embraces and he celebrates it. In fact, he comes home and he says, come share in my happiness. We have to know that there's risk that's cooked into this whole thing. This whole thing we call our lives, especially in this parable, there's risk that's cooked into this thing, but it's based, it's a risk that's based on participation. I'm going to pause here and ask a question. What kind of world are you living in? You know, at any time that we do anything, there's a chance that we will risk and we will make a whole mess out of the whole ordeal. That we will fail tragically. That we will just absolutely lose. There's a chance they will break your heart. There are so many things in our lives where we have no control over the outcome. To live is to risk. Those who have kids, <laughs> you know this. Those who make things, those who preach or teach or farm or run a company, you understand this principle and this basic truth. That risk is part of the equation, but the joy is in the work itself. The joy is in the participation of that risk. The gift is in the giving. The boss man wants them to participate. And for those who do, he even asks them to participate in his own happiness. The risk is deeply connected to the participation with this absurd, beautiful, abundant gift of grace that he gives to them. It's deeply connected to this, I'll say it again, wonderful, beautiful, abundant gift of grace that he gives them that they do not deserve. But the parable is not just about the five and the two bag of gold dudes. This is also a parable about judgment. We can't ignore it. We can't dance around it. The owner is furious at the one bag of gold guy. You could even say he was deeply offended. Listen to the one bad guy's explanation. He says, I knew you were a hard man. Another translation says that I knew you were a harsh human. I knew you were a hard man, so what? So I was afraid. Nowhere in this parable do we get any hint or any kind of impression that this is a harsh man that we should be afraid of in any way, shape, or form. All we see is this in, in incredibly absurd generosity. But this one person, he says, I, I think that you're like this and I was afraid. he fundamentally misunderstands the nature of the owner. One bag of gold guy fundamentally misunderstands the very nature of the owner. Many people, even in this room today, are still fundamentally misunderstanding the nature of God. And part of it is because of bad translations and interpretations of parables like this. They're so afraid of God that they can't even receive his love, let alone share it with the world around them. 
they so fundamentally misunderstand the nature of who God is and how God acts in this world that they're afraid and they literally dig a hole and they bury the beautiful life-giving gifts that God has bestowed upon them. Are you with me? I, I, I had this God image at one point in my life. I remember as a child being so afraid of, of the judgment of God that I had this line on the end of, of my nightly prayer. Lord, for any sin that I've committed today that I've forgotten to ask for your forgiveness, Lord, please forgive me. It was a fear-based prayer that if I happened to not wake up that morning, I would stand before the judgment of God and he would not be loving father, he would be harsh task master who would throw me into a place of wailing and gnashing of teeth. I fundamentally was misunderstanding the very nature of the God that I was supposed to love and I was supposed to serve. Listen, if you serve a God that you wouldn't let babysit your kids, then you probably have the wrong image of God. Right? If we read the New Testament and we believe it as truth, then we, then we can at least, we have to know that God from here on out always will at least be as nice as Jesus. <laughs> well, pastor, what about the God of the Old Testament? Oh, I'm not certain. I didn't live then, but let me tell you, I know Jesus. I have a personal relationship with him. I'd like to introduce you to him. And I know that this is the incarnational presence of God in the world. So if you're wondering what God is like, all you need to do is read about the life of Jesus, the one we call Christ. This servant who's given freely 20 years worth of wages misunderstands the nature of the gift. And instead of receiving it and participating with it, he buries it out of fear. What kind of world are you living in? Is your life an adventure to go on or a trial to endure? Is reality at its core dark and every once in a while there's some light that breaks through or is it love and light and the darkness is just temporary and passing? A great poet once said, to be here now is glorious. Is it glorious? Is it glorious or are the cynics right? Is life something you just have to put up with? Or is it an extraordinary, abundant gift that you are the free recipient of? The people I know who are most alive in one way or another, they have this stance, they have this posture in life. And it looks something like this. Um, can you believe this? They're full of wonder. They, 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 it's like, can you, can, you believe, can you believe that? Can you believe this day? Can you believe this thing that just happened? Can you believe that, that this is going on? Like, can you believe that I was able to accomplish this? Like, can you believe that? Look and see what God is doing. What God, can you believe? They just have this sense of awe, this sense of wonder. At some point, there was a rock bottom decision that they made that they were gonna live in a world of wonder and awe and abundance. And this is the lens through which they gaze upon their life and the world. But the one bag of guy, a gold guy refuses to believe that the owner is really like that. And what really angers the owner is how he sees him. I can't understand any interpretation that sees the master like this either. The master is not like any other overly demanding taskmaster. The master is the one who says, everything you have been given is gift. How are you going to participate? I read the judgment of the master as what happens now. 
Well, pastor, you don't talk about hell enough. Well, I don't have to talk about hell enough. I know enough people right now that are living in their own personal hell. And it's right here and it's right now and it's dark and it's sad and it's broken. And I cry with them and I pray with them. And I see this as something that is happening now. I read this judgment of this parable about something that happens now. You don't trust the owner. You refuse to participate in this life and you will miss out on the joy, on the happiness, on the celebration, on the possibility now. You live stingy and it comes back on you now. You live in your smallness and it comes back on you now. You live in your fear and it comes back on you now. You live in your uptightness and it comes back on you now. You live in your rule keeping and it comes back on you now. Your obsession with being right and it comes back on you. A couple of you are getting it. You live in your scorecard keeping or you're trying to prove or protect everything whatever, and you miss out on the joy and the gift and the grace yes. now. Yes. Can you believe it? We see all these people posturing and posing on the internet. This helps so much, right? It's all around us, how popular, how cool, how accomplished they are. Is it actually making anyone anywhere actually happy? Or, or is it this sense of, of judgment that we bring upon ourselves because we compare ourselves and all the more and more and we make everyone miserable in the process? See, this parable, it, it is about judgment, but it's a different kind. It's a judgment we bring on ourselves. It is enter now or miss it now. When Jesus tells this story, it has hard edges to it. And it's not easy to really know about how people respond to a massive, extravagant gift. Do you trust it? Do you enter into it? Do you participate with it? Or do you hold on to your own story, make up how you've decided it is, and go and bury it? It is less about the buried bag of gold and more about the refusal to trust the story that's unfolding in front of him. How you see it shapes how you live it. You don't have to do any of this. You get to do it. You get to do this. The messages you send yourself will deeply shape how you live out this gift of life. Frederick Beekner says one of my favorite quotes. He says, he says uh, this is your life. Beautiful and tragic things are going to happen, but don't be afraid. Which brings us to the owner's response to what the owner has. Number three, he gives it away. In giving, in giving it away, he keeps the flow. And the one bag of gold guy stops the flow. He doesn't keep it going. He literally buries it. If you're a boss or a student or you work in an office and you begin to see yourself as the receiver and the only interesting thing about your day or your life is how you can pass that which you've received on begins to change things. If you realize that the gift is actually in the giving and not in what you receive back from it, it begins to change everything. If you begin with the grace of the gift and all you <laughs> are responsible to do is to pass it along, to participate in it, everything begins to shift. It has immediate consequences about how we engage our lives and the lives we live with others. Here's the goal. Grace is about having some skin in the game. It's about being alive, not winning or defeating, but participating. Amen. By the way, like I said, the owner is gone for most of the story, but he instigates this whole thing. 
The parable is that there is this mystery of grace that's living just below the surface of the question. The question is, will the servants trust that or will they cling to some other story? Remember, Jesus is headed to his death and he's preparing them like we touched on earlier. What do people talk about when they're dying? Well, this is one of the things I know. This is one of the things pastors do. When people are dying, they say, what a joy. What a gift. Where is my family? What an amazing opportunity I have had to live this life. There's this lesson I have learned and it's taken my whole life to learn it. I need to give it away to the people that I care about before I go. It's about, the, it's about this beautiful thing that they've been given that they can't give away fast enough. And this is what Jesus is doing with his disciples. He's preparing them. He's telling them, guys, I'm about to go. And there's some fundamental things I need you to understand about the world in which you are going to live. He's trying to instill in his disciples and in each one of us some alternative way of viewing the whole thing. So he tells them a story about a grace at work and about a participation in it. As I look around the room, I see a lot of people who already know this and live this way. And I think it's so beautiful. I'll tell you a short story about a lady named Cindy. At the church in Dallas, as I was reviewing the books every week, I kept seeing these very large checks from this woman named Cindy that, that would come through very sporadically. And for a year, and I wrote her thank you notes, but for a year, I, I never met this person, Cindy. And the church was only like 225 people at this time. Who is this Cindy? And how in the world are these? I mean, she's not here, so I can just tell you, she was well over $100,000 a year giver. And for a small church, that, that's like, you pay attention to that. <laughs> it was messing up my budgeting because it was so infrequent. I didn't know if it was ever gonna come or not come and I couldn't. So anyway, I set up a meeting and I finally met Cindy and she was in China half the time and consulting over here half the time. She came as a single person. I said, Cindy, would you coach me on how I'm supposed to pastor you? <laughs> because I don't wanna treat you differently than anyone else, but this kind of money makes me feel very insecure that I'm going to, fa I'm gonna favor you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna treat you differently and I won't be able to pastor you well some things you get to say when you're in your twenties and you're a senior pastor for the first time. She said, absolutely. She gave me a book. I read it and we started meeting regularly. I finally asked her, I said, Cindy, why do you give so much money? She didn't live in a way that you would expect it. That you could even tell. She said, when I was a single mom in Lubbock, Texas, on a Sunday night, she said, I walked into a church the pastor stopped before he closed in the benediction and he said, there's someone in here who doesn't have enough gas in their car or money to put gas in their car to get home. And he said, and if you're brave enough to stand up, we want to bless you. She said, that was me. She said, ever since then, I made a deal that whenever I had something, I was going to get it because there was somebody else who needed it. I think she became as successful and as wealthy as she became, and I think she would say it too, because she always practiced living in this world of there is enough, there is enough abundance, and I'm always looking for opportunities to be able to give it away. I think she's the five bag of gold person that ended up with 10. <laughs> And then the one from the other one who chose not to live in that grace-filled free life. So here's the deal. 
If you wanna test this, if you really wanna see how this really works, if you wanna let this really do its work on you, pray about it this week and ask God what you should give away and give it away. Not something you would normally give, something that costs you something, something that really means something. And I promise you, your eyes will begin to open up to a whole new landscape of grace and of truth and of beauty that is all around you. And it will start to show itself in the most unexpected and in the most ordinary places. It's not so much that, that, that when you give $20, God's gonna give you back 200, not that he can't. But when you accept this, this massive generous gift and then you respond and you don't stop the flow, you give this generous gift back, you begin to see with different eyes a world that is full of goodness and truth and beauty and gracefulness and unmerited favor and opportunities to be love and light and goodness in the world around you. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is not like manifesting the secret. This is not like name it, claim it, and frame it. This is like live a life of generosity and watch the world begin to unfold in ways that you could never even expect. And at the end of your days, you will share in the master's happiness. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, son of God, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For everything you have done, everything you are doing now, and everything you will do in the future. May we, each one of us, see our lives as this absurd, beautiful, wonderful, free gift that has been given to us. Lord, may we not in fear bury it, but may we live it fully knowing there's risk involved, knowing that there's all sorts of stuff that might happen and will happen. But Lord, <laughs> let us participate in it because that's all that you're asking of us. We love you, Lord. We trust you. And we say thank you. Amen. 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 Let's all stand together. People of God. Brothers and sisters of Christ Jesus, may the grace and the peace of our Lord and Savior go with you from this place. May you see it with new eyes and with open hearts. May you go from this place to love and serve this God's good world. Peace be with you.